isn't it great to have to be in a field that's providing this crucial technology during this past year? It really is. Yeah, I mean, until like a year ago, whenever I'd mentioned that I'd be, I'm working like on telepresence, people would say, what? Well, you know, sort of like um, Skype, you know, but, you know, better. Imagine, you know, it's like 3D and you're co-located. You'd say, why would I want to do that? And now I don't have to explain why. I think everybody realizes we'd like to be together and Boy, and if it weren't for Zoom, I mean, if this were 10 years ago, this would have been a, a much worse experience, I think. Because yeah, 10 but... years ago, you know, the televideo wasn't as well developed as it was this past year. I think it would have been much more serious. Yeah, absolutely. And 20 years ago, we still needed really powerful PCs to do the compression and decompression. And most people didn't have enough bandwidth to their home to support televideo, even if they had powerful enough PCs. All right, so we'll get started in a couple minutes here. Thank you to everybody who's already uh, present. Appreciate it. You can say how great it is to have an association for computing machinery. Yeah, we'll definitely be getting to that. <laughs> yeah. and to have a local club that is associated with this international organization. I think it's a great, great combination. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Yeah, I think I've belonged to it since I was a student. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really great. People ask me, why do you belong? And I feel like I'm part of this community. Mm -hmm. And I want to contribute to it financially as well as, you know, with my feet that I go to the conferences. I feel great that I could sign up and say, I'm a member. Yeah, this is worthwhile. Absolutely. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and, and get started now. So let me just share my screen really quickly. All right, so first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out to the inaugural event of um, ACM. ACM stands for the Association uh, for Computing Machinery. We really appreciate your presence today, and I'd like to give a special thank you uh, to Dr. Henry Fuchs and also Dr. Fred Brooks for giving their time uh, to, be, to participate in this event. So Here's a little introduction to ACM at UNC and our board. Uh, my name is Nihar Vaidya. I am the co-president of ACM along with Raghu Padma. Cole Vehi is our treasurer and Brent Munsell is our faculty sponsor. Uh, the rest of our board is listed on this screen as well. If you have any questions about ACM at all or anything in general, you can always reach out to anyone on the screen here. All right, so, so what is ACM? So ACM is the world's largest computing society. Um, Dr. Fuchs touched on it a little bit uh, if you were here in the beginning. It, we support the professional growth of our members by providing learning opportunities, career development, and career networking opportunities. Um, there are over 860 professional and student chapters of ACM around the world. ACM is best known for giving out the Turing Award named after Alan Turing. It's equivalent to the Nobel Prize for the computer science field. ACM was founded in 1947 during a meeting at Columbia University as a result of an increase in interest in computing related meetings and conferences. ACM gives the chance for professors, researchers, students, and others to exchange ideas and hear about the latest and greatest in technology and computer science education. Since its creation, ACM has grown internationally and hosts on average 170 technology related events per year.
Thank you, Nikar, for the introduction about ACM. Um, again, we're super excited to have our own chapter uh, of ACM here at UNC. And our main goal is to really spread the influence of computer science throughout UNC's campus and create a strong community here. And we hope to provide students with opportunities which include a greater access to UNC's distinguished computer science faculty and faculty talks, such as this one with Dr. Fuchs and Dr. Brooks, um, social activities, networking opportunities, workshops, educational resources, ACM sponsored conferences, and more. And hopefully when we're in person next fall, we can have all of these things. Um, Nihar, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Also, we are, we are also proud to say that UNC's faculty consists of four ACM fellows. One of the ACM fellows is Dr. Fred Brooks, who also won the ACM Turing Award and multiple other awards throughout his career. And we will be watching an interview with him answering student asked questions in a bit. Another ACM fellow at UNC is, of course, Dr. Henry Fuchs, who we have with here with us here today. Um, and Dr. Uh, Fuchs won an ACM SIGGRAPH Achievement Award in 1992 and is a pioneer in computer graphics. He was talking a, lot, a little bit about that if you joined uh, early. And all of you guys will have a chance to ask Dr. Fuchs any questions when we talk to him, I think, at maybe 5 o'clock. So I'm super excited to see what you guys have to ask and see what Dr. Fuchs has to say. Our third ACM fellow at UNC is Dr. James Anderson, who is known for his contributions in real-time systems, distributed and concur con concurrent algorithms, multi-core computing, and operating systems. Finally, our last ACM fellow at UNC is Dr. Dinesh Manocha, who is known for his work in computer graphics, augmented and virtual reality, robotics, and more. And again, we're super glad to have two of those fellows be able to talk to us today. So a little introduction on Dr. Fred Brooks. He's the start of our event. He was an ACM Turing Award winner, awarded the National Medal of Technology at the White House in 1985. He also managed the development of IBM's revolutionary 360 family of computers, was integral in deciding upon how many bits are in a byte. There's a little bit of that in the interview with him. And he also founded UNC's computer science department. Uh, Dr. Brooks really wanted to be here in person with everyone today to be able to talk uh, unfortunately, due to health reasons, we had to pre-record the interview with him. The interview with Dr. Brooks that we recorded is approximately 45 minutes long. However, today at this meeting, we will only be showing uh, a portion of that interview. Um, the full length interview will be available on our YouTube channel that anyone can view at any time. Um, so we'll get started by watching that interview right now. And then after, after watching the interview with Dr. Brooks, we will get into our conversation with Dr. Fuchs. So let me just. Hello and welcome. I'm Nihar Vaidya along with Raghu Padma for UNC ACM. Joining us today is Dr. Fred Brooks, an American computer architect, software engineer, and computer scientist best known for managing the development of IBM's System 360 family of computers and the OS 360 software support package, then later writing about the process in his book, The Mythical Man Month. Dr. Brooks has received many awards, including the National Medal of Technology in 1985 and the Turing Award in 1999. Dr. Brooks, thank you so much for being with us here today. Glad to be there, thank you. Dr. Brooks, we'll get started with our first question. You're renowned for many amazing achievements and your impacts on the field of computer science. However, if there was one non-technical thing that you could be known for, what would you want that to be? That I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And I became one when I was 31. I had been raised a, a loyal churchman, but I hadn't known Christ personally until my colleague Jerry Blau at IBM introduced me to what it really means to be a Christian. So that's the non-technical thing that's most important in my life. As I said, I was raised a nominal Christian, but my undergraduate education included a year of Old Testament and New Testament taught by a professor and an ordained minister 
who undertook to relieve all these undergraduates of their Sunday school faith and make the scripture appear unreliable. And so I was convinced. And then when I was 31, Dr. Jerry Blau, with whom I wrote a book later, invited my wife and me over to his house where he and Paula were hosting a small group studying the Bible. And Jerry clearly believed the scripture was dependable. And some years later, about three years later, after intense study and praying, I became a real Christian believer. So that's the story of how I became a Christian. And it's been an important part of my life ever since and still is. Can you maybe touch on how it has been an important part of your life? Was there any events that have happened or anything that's occurred that's particularly important to you? Well, in you know, life has ups and downs, and it has been a great comfort in the downs, and added rejoicing in the ups. The ups being three children, a wonderful wife, nine grandchildren, for example. So I find the teachings of the scripture and the fact that Jesus died for my sins to be a great comfort. And when one is uh, almost 90, it means you have no fear of dying. And that's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Brooks, for your response. Um, moving on to the next question. Of all the projects that you contributed to, which one has been the most meaningful, meaningful or fulfilling to you personally? The 360 hardware development has been the most meaningful personally. We set out to change the world and we did among the changes we changed the whole industry from six bit bytes with only uppercase characters and numbers to eight bit bytes, including lowercase characters, which made word processing possible. And that was adopted by the rest of the IBM product line and then by the rest of the industry. And so that's been very meaningful to me. That was the big, biggest internal debate that I've ever been a part of was whether to do that. And it cost us an extra $100 million, 1960s dollars, to change all the input out devices, all new printers, all new tape drives, all new discs, even the card punches had to be changed to accommodate eight bits. Were there any challenges that you faced in that project that are that particularly stand out to you? Yes. There was a, originally we had proposed, IBM at that time had two product divisions that made computers. The data systems division made middle size and the upper. The general products division made middle, middle size and down. And we had them. Originally, I was a head of architecture for the data, data systems division. I was brought back from research for doing, after doing that, for doing that. And we worked up a whole product line called the 8,000 series. And I presented 
in an all day meeting on January 61, I think. And everybody was carried away with him. We had to carry it through first level forecasting, first level cost estimating, first level market assessment, the whole business. And we had three products, a big, a small, and a middle, but in between in that product line. The small one wasn't really very small, it was middle size. And everybody was happy, except one fellow sitting in the back of the room. And that was coming to Vice President Van Nissen. And that night, my boss got transferred to Colorado. And a new boss from the other division brought him <laughs> and listened, told him, go in and assess that plan. If it's good, make it work. If it's bad, change it. So Bob came in and we fought for a while. We fought from January until March and I scared the fight all the way to the corporate management committee and I won, but Bob didn't quit. And he carried it back to him and he won. And then we fought like cats and dogs from January to March. At one point he called me up, he said, Fred, I want you to know you've got a raise. I was surprised. I said, thank you, Bob. I want you to know I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but then this meant a total throwing that plan away and adopting Bob's plan <phone rings> meant going to all different machines. And so he had a big reorganization meeting to decide who was going to be working on which project. Well, I was going back to research. I was just disgusted. And during that week, I went, but I went to the meeting up at Lake Saratoga to see where, make sure my boys landed on their feet in the reorganization. And to my amazement, when Thursday came, he came to me and said, will you take the new product line, which was the crown jewels of his plan? I was dumbfounded. You couldn't have knocked me over with a fellow because we'd been fighting so hard. But I guess he thought I was a worthy adversary and he became one of my closest friends as well as my boss for the next few years. A very big man. That's an incredible story. Do you think that that, that that argument that you guys had, that the way that you guys fought for those three, four months, how do you think that that changed like the future of technology from that point onwards? Well, his proposal was that we wait until 64 with the new product line. And when there would be integrated circuits as instead of transistors. And that would give us a, the ability to make things about half the price. But it would mean fighting the competition with placeholders essentially for three years. And it was iffy as to whether we could do that. So that was part of the argument. But by we built the first machines that they weren't even fully integrated, but they were batch made transistors instead of handmade vacuum tubes. And so 
that was a, a big step forward. And instead of trans, instead of discrete transistors with little wires on them that place by hand in the different circuits, not vacuum tubes. That was previous generation. Thank you, Dr. Brooks, so much for the commentary on that last question. It was very insightful. Um, moving on, I guess something that's more uh, close to home is if you were an undergrad in today's year of 2021, what would you spend your extracurricular time learning, doing, or even building? The most important thing I did in high school, college, in terms of my career, was public speaking. Debate, RTI, extemporaneous, impromptu. I started in the eighth grade. In my, I tried out for the high school varsity debate team because in my in my town, the eighth grade was part of high school. Well, all the big boys had gone to war. They finished high school in three years so they could join the service. That was 1944. And so I made the full person first the debate team. Mm -hmm. I was paired with the senior girl and we were debating the state topic, resolved that 18 year olds should get the right to vote. We had lost the first round, but that was the start of my public speaking career. And of all the things I did, that was at least as important as any course I took or any other part of my education. And it's part of my loss during my stroke that I can't speak as fluently as I did before, but I still have my Southern accent. <laughs> Is there any one moment that you maybe remember where you thought, wow, I'm so happy that I studied public speaking? Is there any one talk that you gave that stands out to you or anything like that? Well, I gave three addresses about the 360 family to the team that had developed it. And at that time, I thought I was leaving to come to Chapel Hill then. In fact, Tom Watson asked me to stay and see the software and alpha test. And so I stayed another year. But those were essentially farewell addresses. And that was an important occasion. Why do you think, uh, given that all you've said about public speaking, that public speaking is such an important thing for college students to learn? If you're in charge of a team, even building a four person team, you have to be able to rally the team on the one hand and convince your boss and on up that it's worth doing and explain why you're late and so forth. So the communication skills, if you haven't developed them in high school, that's a very important thing to do as an undergraduate. Well, thank you, Dr. Brooks. That was um, an awesome opportunity for us and the ACM club. And I'm sure that our peers will enjoy uh, watching this interview. Um, again, we thank you for your time. Yep. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Brooks. We really appreciate you taking the time today to speak with us. And we know that all of our members and all the undergrad 
computer science students at UNC uh, will really appreciate this insight. Thank you very much. I appreciate being invited. And I enjoyed your questions. And I wish I could be there in person with the audience. And I wish they could be there in person too. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a little preview of our interview that we had with Fred Brooks. I want to thank everyone that submitted questions for him. Um, there were more questions that he answered involving his acceptance of both the Turing Award and the National Medal of Technology. There's commentary on where he sees technology going in the future his thoughts on ethics within technology and also around AR and VR. So make sure to go watch that full length video if you get the time, it's very insightful. And there's a lot of things that we had to cut for the sake of time uh, so that we could uh, show it here today. So let's go back to our slides. So now, um, first off, we have, all right, Raghu, do you want to? Yeah, I hope you guys all enjoyed that video. Dr. Brooks is a truly awesome guy. Um, but again, just as a recap, we had an opportunity for students to submit questions for Dr. Brooks a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we wanted to just shout those students out whose questions got selected to be answered. Um, not all of their questions appeared in the shortened version, of course, some of theirs are in the longer version. But the names of those students whose questions got chosen are Lindsay Zhao, Ellie Evans, Cole Vehi, Zaka Devaredi, Robbie Tillman, Madison Humer. I want to congratulate these students, but also I just wanted to thank everyone who did submit a question. I think there were around 130 questions submitted, so it was really awesome to, you know, see that kind of engagement. Um, we'll also be giving away two additional gift cards to students who asked Dr. Fuchs a question, so make sure to stick around and ask questions, and we'll be in touch with everybody um, regarding like prizes and stuff in the next week or so, just so just keep a lookout for that. All right, so moving on, let me give Dr. Fuchs a little short introduction. Uh, Dr. Henry Fuchs is a Frederico Gill Distinguished Professor at UNC. He is an ACM Fellow. He was awarded the 1992 ACM SIG Graph Achievement Award. He specializes in graphics, rendering algorithms, hardware, virtual environments, and medical applications. He pioneered in high performance parallel display architecture for graphics processors. And he's currently, like I said, a professor in the computer science department. So right now is the time to talk to Dr. Fuchs. Um, the way we're gonna do this is I'm gonna drop a poll. Yeah, Raghu dropped the poll everywhere in the chat. Um, you don't need to ask a question. If you want to, you can submit one and you can, we will, uh, Dr. Fuchs, the conversation will steer towards uh, which question gets the most upvotes. So maybe some of you have done this in your classes before where you get to vote on the top question. Uh, and so we'll, we'll give it like a minute for people to be able to submit questions uh, and then we'll take the top question and Dr. Fuchs will start from there. All right. Dr. Fuchs, if you want to talk about anything, just start us off, just feel free to do oh, so. Wow, there's so many things. I mean, I could go on talking all the time about Fred Brooks. I, I don't, I mean, as, as good as that interview was, I'm not sure that uh, if I were an undergraduate at Carolina now, that I would gain any sense of the immense influence that Fred Brooks has had on the computer industry and the immense influence he had on UNC Chapel of Computer Science. Uh, what didn't come through that you might be interested in, did you know that his father was a professor here? And really? they lived just off campus, a couple of blocks off campus in Westwood. Yeah, really his, interesting. Uh, his, the house is still there. He showed it to me once we drove by. You know, it's a standard little white clapboard house. Um, That's awesome. So he was coming home. He was, the reason he came home, uh, so he tells me, is while he was developing, you know, he was head of this, the Project 360, to give you some idea, was the biggest computer development in history. Uh, I read a paper about it later in one of the business magazines, Fortune, and the title was IBM's $5 billion gamble. 
the size of that project was roughly the size of the Manhattan Project in World War II in terms of the amount of money. I mean, it was about the size of the project of building the atomic bomb. They were, everybody in IBM all over the world was involved in this massive project. And they redid the entire line of computers in all the different divisions. And at the time, IBM had something like 70% of the computer market. Okay, so imagine the combination of, you know, Intel, Microsoft, Facebook, you know, all of the computer companies put together. Okay, they were known at, you know, the computer industry at the time was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I mean, they were so gigantic, you don't even remember any of the other computer companies. I mean, does anybody remember what other computer company was you know, was in around in 1965? I mean, give me three of the computer companies that were around then. Anybody? It is just an amazing thing. Uh, Digital Equipment Corporation. Anybody heard of digital? Burroughs, okay? Uh, let's see, Control Data Corporation. I mean, all of these, you know, they're like history. IBM is still around, but it was so dominant and it became dominant even more so after 360 was introduced because it not only allowed these new capabilities of uppercase, lowercase everywhere, you know, down to the bit representation, it meant that there was an, a, a single level architecture from the lowest machine to the biggest supercomputer. That means that from a programmer standpoint and from a compiler standpoint, they compile to the same machine. So those of you who are taking my 311 know some more about this, but it was just an amazing, audacious uh, risk. They bet the company on this. And the guy that headed the architecture project, and then eventually he headed the whole thing, the software also, because the software was late, okay? This guy, Fred Brooks, so he was born in 1931. So he was heading this project in 1963, you know, 1962, three and four. He was telling you about, you know, all these fights to get it established in 1961. You guys understand? The guy was 30 years old, okay? When he talks about Watson trying to persuade him to stay in the company, that was T.J. Watson Jr., the, you know, the CEO of IBM. And he said no. Okay, why did he say no? Because he wanted to come back to Southern Town. And I'm really moved by that. Okay, this guy that could have earned many, many more millions of dollars than he did here, he decided to come back here to start a computer science department. And we are all the beneficiaries of that. Okay, I mean, his stature at the time was just amazing. I was, I happened to interview here in 1978. I already had a job at UT Dallas. I was happy there. I had colleagues, I had friends. And then through some people making some calls, I could go into later. I happened to drop my CV to this one place. This is the only place. And they called up and I thought, why not? You know, I had heard about Brooks, you know, through reputation, I came and he, really impressed me, okay? I mean, to give you one data point, um, I see him like the first day, no, I give a talk, you know? And then we go out to dinner, okay? The next day I'm about to leave because I see a bunch of other people, you know, in the department, I'm about to leave and I have an appointment to, you know, say goodbye to him. I walk into his office and he is looking through you know, a paper like this. Can you see me? He's reading through this. And he's, he signs the paper. And he says, uh, here, I think uh, you want to sign this too. Boy, I was thinking, what is this? <laughs> Wait, I had got an offer. I'm just visiting here, right? I look at it and it says, invention disclosure. Fred Brooks, Henry Fuchs, inventors. 
I'm, I'm, I'm not, what? He said, you know, the stuff that we talked about last night, I think it's worthy of a patent. I think you got an idea there. We had chatted about some idea for a 3D display with uh, some vibrating mirrors and um, a close channel. I mean, the details are not important, right? But the guy realized it was something worthy of writing down. He writes it down personally. It's a finished three-page document and he signs it and he wants me to sign it as an inventor. How impressive is that? The guy is an apartment chairman. I'm just a nobody. I just happened to come give a talk, right? I'll give you a second data point. I happen to be getting a call from another uh, department. Uh, let's say it's one of the top five departments in the country. Okay, we should not name them because, you know, these poor guys. Anyway, I give a talk there. On the way to the airport, the head of the uh, computer science drives me to the airport at the end of the visit there. And he says, Henry, I hear really good things in the hallways about uh, people who think you're really great. Uh, I said, wonderful. I mean, you know, I have a job already. He said, uh, we have to interview like several more people, but I think if you could hang tight for like maybe another four weeks, uh, I think um, we could get you an offer. I say, okay, thank you. I mean, you know, I already have a job. I don't need another job, right? I fly here like two days later. I interview, I think, I don't know, on a Thursday or no, Wednesday and a Thursday, I think. I get a call on Saturday morning, I think, from Fred Brooks. Uh, maybe it was Friday afternoon. He says, um, the faculty met. We don't want to look at anybody else. Uh, if you could hold on to Monday, I'm going to go see the dean, see if we can get you an offer on Monday. <laughs> wow, I think what a guy. I call up one of my old professors. It's really good to keep in touch with old professors. What do I do, Rich? I say, you know, it's really this uh, uh, interesting dilemma. Do you go to this really famous place, you know, wait for another four weeks, or do I grab this thing which they're just offering me instantly? And my old professor said, you know, at this famous place, there are a lot of famous people, but they think you're doing something with like bits and pixels and images, you know, you're playing around with images. When it comes to evaluating you, they're probably gonna have to send out uh, for letters to see, you know, how good people think you are. If you go to Chapel Hill, Fred Brooks won't need to rely on the letters. He'll know how good you are. So I called back Brooks. I said, I'm coming. That's what I thought of Brooks. You know, the first couple of meetings. Does that get you started? By the way, he's really right. He was considerably more vigorous a year ago before he had the stroke. He had a really massive stroke uh, April uh, 16th or 17th last year. It was really terrible. His whole right side uh, was affected. I don't think he could move. So he's had a lot of uh, speech therapy and occupational therapy and physical therapy just to get to the point where he is like this. But as you could tell, his mind doesn't seem to have been affected, which is really great. It's really great. Yeah. Uh, so does that get us started? Yeah, I just wanted to also point out that this is supposed to be like extremely conversational. So if sure, you guys just undo your, you know, unmute. We're here among friends. So if anybody has a follow up question that sure. they'd like to ask Henry or anything like that, feel free. Just shout out. Yeah. It's I, wow. I haven't we haven't seen each other in a few years. It's been a while, hasn't yes. it? How are you? <laughs> I'm doing really well. Thank you. You're right. Yeah, um, it's really good to be here. I'm, I was really happy to, to listen to everything you said, because um, I think you made a really good point that, you know, Brooks is kind of a very towering figure and, and there's so much about him that a lot of us don't really know. And that, that interview is a wonderful start, but I think hearing your stories, it's like, wow, there's, there's a huge history to the CS department um, that, you know, that's so exciting to hear about and learn. Well, I'm glad. I mean, I could tell you a lot more. I mean, when when he started the department, he knew because, you know, his father was professor here. He knew that this is a 
a broadly based university. You know, it's not an institute of technology. Uh, it's going to be uh, a, only a medium sized department and it's going to reach out to the rest of the department. It's not going to be just for, you know, technical people. And so he carefully decided on what uh, four areas that they're going to concentrate on to start with. And each of those, you know, had to do with things that he thought were going to have legs, you know, for a long time. I mean, I still remember the four that they advertised when I looked at their ad. That's what got me to drop a line here. Uh, let's see if I can remember them. Uh, software engineering, computer architecture, uh, computer graphics, medical imaging. And hey, I thought, <laughs> these are things I'm interested in. Should I tell you about VR? Yes, please. Okay, so, uh, you know, he, somebody asked, you know, what is the most important course that, you know, you took you know, as an undergraduate? I, I mean, I think that I agree with him. Basically, communication is really the most important thing. But one of the things that I remember is uh, I took an independent study with Alan Kay at Stanford, and he showed me a paper among the many things he showed me, may he be blessed, was a paper then new. This was, I took the, I was with him in 1969 as an undergraduate, and it was a paper in 1968 published by a guy named Ivan Sutherland, and the title was a head-mounted three-dimensional display. And what he talked about was, and he showed a system demonstrated that there were a couple of little displays, one inch CRTs that you put on your head and with a half silvered mirror and a sort of close up lens, you could see the displays, you know, in front of you in stereo and you also see the room in front of you. And he had a tracking system so you could move around and the system would update the image on a frame by frame basis, I forgot how fast, but in real time, like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 times a second. So as you moved around, the objects could move so that they appeared to stay in the room stationary in front of you. You know, so you build a molecule and you could look around it. You could walk around this molecule in the room, hanging in space. You could touch it with a uh, device, a hand grip. You could touch it and you can move it around. You could stretch things and so on. That was so exciting. So if I look back on the whatever 50 years has been since then, almost everything I've done has something to do with that system. What does it take to make something so you could see it in front of you and you walk around and you share the space with it? I mean, that's what's called augmented reality now, or virtual reality. But you know, a lot of people saw that paper because it was at the major national conference, but uh, I've, and I've talked to other people who saw the paper and they admitted to me, eh, we didn't get it. That is, they saw the paper, they saw what it was, but they, they weren't excited by it. Like this is the future, right? Computers could control the appearance of matter in your space. And Sutherland said, don't think about pictures on a screen as just dots on the screen. Think about it as a window into a wonderland created by the computer. And in VR, that's what that is. That wonderland you share yourself. So all these other kinds of things to me, you know, like I was looking at Snap Camera today. Do you guys look at Snap Camera? Itai, you must know about Snap Camera, right? You could do all these effects. You know, it's like the famous uh, scene where I am not, I am not a cat, right? You remember that? There was Hello, a new from the where some attorney appears on Zoom in a courtroom and he looks like a cat and he's talking like a cat, right? And he says, excuse me, judge, but something's happened to my interface. I'm not a cat. <laughs> and the judge says, yes, I believe you're not a cat. I can see that. But, you know, all that stuff of modifying the imagery to make things look different. The, the ones in 2D are just the, the minimal versions of what we're gonna have in the future, right? Because once we have the displays in our glasses, really in our glasses that we wear all day, then that's when the world will really change. Now it's just you know proof of concepts. What do you think, Adai? Um, I actually, <laughs> 
I actually really agree with everything you said. Um, last year, I, I got a VR headset. And I don't know if you've heard of it, um, but there's a game called Half-Life Alex um, made by Valve. And they really brought cutting edge to VR. Um, and it's it's very immersive. Um, and I've played it a lot. And it's really fun. Cool. I think yeah. I've heard, but I've never played it. I'm writing it down. All right. It's it's really fun. Um, cool. And and the headset, it, it has hand controls that um, it'll sense where your hands are. And you can like curl your fingers and it will um it will detect that as well so you can interact with real objects yeah that's really great yeah i think the world is going to change even more in the next 10 years i think we and i think that uh this uh this pandemic in um, various ways uh have accelerated the appetite for people to have more effective interactions that are enhanced by computers. Hey, Professor Fuchs. How are you, Melanie? Good, Boy, how are you doing? It's been like a day. <laughs> I know, for a long time. <laughs> um, yeah, so I we sent out a link for people to ask questions. So uh, the, the number one question right now um, is, what do you wish uh, current computer science students could focus more on or improve on? Wow. That's not such an easy question. I think current computer science students are fabulous. I mean, to a first approximation, computer science students are fabulous, okay? Um, I mean, I could tell you what I think that from a computer science curriculum, what I think we could do better as a department, but then I could tell you what I would recommend you as an individual computer science student, okay? So first I'll answer the one about how is the department. Uh, I wish that we as a department could have a more comprehensive, integrated, richer curriculum because we're so, as you well know, as you all well know, we're so limited by the relatively few faculty that we have that there's relatively few courses. We can only teach like the most absolute uh, minimum necessary courses. But if I had my druthers, we would teach from the first year, we would teach an integrated sequence that in my view would start with the base case of, you know, uh, Boolean logic and build up to, you know about some of this, Miller, <laughs> and build up to chips and then build a little computer from the chips and then buy, you know, a microprocessor chip and build the one board computer and then build from that one book computer, you know, what do you need to do in order to write an assembler? And then, you know, build a compiler on top of that. But everybody building all of that stuff, because it's one thing to use an assembler. It's another thing to build an assembler or to build a compiler. You know, what are all the phases that a compiler needs to do? And then compile. And then what do you need to do to then assemble? And what do you need to do to link it together? And what do you need to do to load it? And then, you know, what is the basis of operating system. So I would, I mean, if I had my druthers, I'd have people build from the ground up everything, including the basis of, you know, very simple operating system, because see, boy, what happens at the operating system kernel and what happens to page tables and what happens to protection? You know, it's like, I want to have people build up so that they understand it from the ground up. That's what I would do as curriculum, but we don't have the luxury for doing that. Now, in terms of what individual students can do, Boy, my feeling is that um, students don't realize until after they graduate how useful non-computer science classes are. Because I think many people who are taking computer science now will have opportunities to learn more technical things later. Whether you get a job now and you're doing, uh, you know, part-time you take class later you know you could go to your boss and say I'm really interested in taking this you know online course on whatever it is you know computer security or data protection you know or you know the latest in operating systems or whatever it is right because your boss will understand you know yeah I guess for this job it's really useful for you to know more about bitcoin or whatever it is 
But what you don't get a chance after an undergraduate year or the four years of undergraduates is to do any other courses. You know, if you are interested in social psychology, or if you're interested in archaeology or in you know political 19th century political theory or 20th century European politics or whatever it is, you can't go to your boss or even if you go to grad school, you go into your advisor and say, you know what, I'm really interested in modern political theory. I think I want to take a course in modern political theory. What is your PhD advisor going to say? Don't you wait till after you uh, submit your dissertation. Right? But in undergraduate, especially a place like Carolina, they encourage you, they require you to take these courses. So my recommendation is take that as a golden opportunity to look for the things that are really exciting for you. You know, the technical subjects you'll be able to do later. I mean, you'll, you'll still do them now because they're required, but it's the non-computer science subjects that I think you want to get excited about and take those. And don't take the easiest ones, take the ones that are most exciting. And by the way, my recommendation, in case you haven't heard, I think the person who teaches that subject is more important than the subject. My daughter called up when she was a freshman at a different college, and she's so excited about astronomy. Who knew, right? Well, I got to know because the next parents' day, I heard her astronomy professor talk. And you know what? This person was so inspiring. It's like, I wanted to take another astronomy course. So I think that having a really effective, exciting teacher is more important than a specific topic. Next. That's super interesting. Um, I think like kind of relating to that, um, the next question is like, what career do you think you would have pursued if you did not go into computer science? Architecture. Until I was in ninth grade, I thought architecture is what I wanted to do because I thought the combination of technical things and practical and making lives better and artistic, I think is is all embodied for you in architecture. I think that is so nice. And while I've dealt with architects occasionally, you know, in applications, when we do like 3D modeling and so on, uh, what turned me off was uh, taking architectural drafting in like ninth grade. And, you know, this is follow up on this question about, you know, teachers make a difference. Because in my high school, you needed to take at least one course in drafting or something. You know, so you knew how to draw basic things. This was, you know, drafting with pencils and T squares and uh, doing lettering and how to do uh, isometric, uh, you know, representation and drawings. And so I was really raring to go for architectural drafting. And the teacher had us do floor joists and subflooring. That wasn't what I was interested in. I want to think about the whole building and flow and how people would move around. And we did none of that. So, and I happened to be in a summer or Christmas program for high school, like science and math. And we visited a junior college and we saw a computer there. And that was it. I saw a computer. I thought, wow, this is like you bring your thoughts and you put them into the machine and it brings your thoughts to life. You say, I wanna draw this curve that's defined in this mathematical way. You put it in and it draws you that curve, you know, or you want the robot to move in this way. You program it and it moves in that way. I thought that was just magic. But architecture, I still think is great. And I occasionally collaborate with architects. The uh, next question that a lot of people have, and then Ryan, we can go to you, is um, what advice do you have for undergraduates who are deciding if they should go to grad school or not? So I'm very biased, right? Because I went to grad school and loved it. So 
my recommendation is if, if you could stand another couple of years of classes and you could afford not to earn the big money, uh, then I think you should go to grad school. But if you can't stand being in school anymore because it's so boring or painful, then by all means don't go. But I think if you could get into a good graduate program, it's really great. But bad graduate programs, I think are really uh, painful. And you could read about them by statistics of what large fraction of graduate students in all fields are not very happy. And that makes me sad because I thought grad school was so much fun there. And I still you know, keep in touch with some of the people that I met and had fellow students. Um, I think it is so great to be able to have the experience of trying lots of different things in grad school. So I highly recommend it. Ryan, go ahead with your question. Oh yeah, um, just because this seems to be, you know, your area, as someone who's very much interested in the area of computer graphics and computer vision, but has more experience in like the creative applications of these programs rather, rather than the development, how do you suggest like finding your foothold in, these, in this area, like, you know, exploring independently? I think that the best way is to look around and see where there's a professor or two whose work you're excited about. And from what you could find out, the professor is a reasonable, nice person. That combination of having a really nice person and having an area of work that you're excited about is I think what you want. Because then if you get into that person's uh, area, you will find all kinds of things that you were initially excited about, but you may not have known about until you got there. So I think having, finding a person that you care about and whose area you care about and who from all you could find out is a nice person and not a tyrant and, you know, not mean, I think is really the key. And I just consider myself very lucky that I was able to find several of those people, both as an undergraduate and as a graduate student. I think I was lucky because there was no uh, ACM student chapter when I was an undergraduate at Santa Cruz. I think there were four of us who graduated in computer science in 1970. There were no computer science professors when I got to Santa Cruz in 66. There was no computer science professors. And several of us told our advisors that we'd really like to learn to like learn something about computers. And so somehow somebody in the university found somebody who offered a uh, course. I could just, I still remember the course. We all showed up in class. They were like 30 of us. And this person in front, he had a stack of green pamphlets. They were, you know, stapled together. They were not books, they were like pamphlets. Uh, they were, you know, sort of like this, okay? Mm -hmm. Except they were stapled, okay? And he passed them out. They were green, and they were something like title, uh, an IBM logo on it, and it has something like a self-study introduction to Fortran. And he said, um, just so you know, I'm not an instructor. I'm, I think he was a salesperson, okay? Uh, but these are self-study, so I think you'll be able to find with these. And during the hours, you know, that we meet here, I'll always be here and I'll be at the desk here. And in case any of you have any questions, come up to me and I'll do my best to try to explain them. So there were self-study, and I still remember it was like one or two pages of description, you know. This is uh, a program is a series of statements where a statement is a command. And here are the examples of them. And then after the you know two pages of text, then there were some questions, you know, self-assessments, multiple choice. They were like six of them, and then you choose one, and then you write it down on a separate piece of paper, and then you look in the back to see if you've got which one you got correct, 
And depending on how many you got correct, you know, you go to another page. You know, if you've got them all correct, then you go on to the next. If not, then you went to another page where they described that particular thing in more detail. So that was what we had in the spring of my freshman year. But to my great good fortune, the university hired not one, but two computer science professors when I was in my sophomore year. And we had, again, a room full of students signing up for introduction to computer science. And in the, one of the professors uh, asked as he was being to talk, he said, um, how many of you know how to program? I remember looking around, there were a few that I recognized from you know the previous self-study class. And we sort of exchanged glances like, do we know how to program? Wait, I mean, you know, we just went through the self-study. I don't think we have seen a computer. Uh, no, we're not sure, no. Uh, so he said, okay, for those of you, uh, if you're interested in a, like being a research assistant, uh, come see me after class. And so like a couple of us went to him after class and he talked to us and he hired two of us on the spot, even though I'd never seen a computer. So I was really lucky. It turns out the guy's name was Harry Husky. I only learned this later because what do I know? You know, he's a professor there, right? He took early retirement from Berkeley. And I learned years later because he was telling me about stories about programming the ENIAC. Wait, what? <laughs> it turns out he was a math instructor at University of Pennsylvania circa 1945 when the first American computer was being constructed at, at the University of Pennsylvania. And he got interested in programming it. But then he was, he wanted to transfer from math department to electrical engineering or wherever this group was. And his department chairman, he says, uh, was not very happy at the idea of losing a mathematician to these, you know, tinkerers. So uh, Harry Husky then, who was an assistant professor, thought maybe he should do something better. And he heard that there was a guy in London who was also building a computer and who was uh, maybe hiring somebody. The guy's name was Alan Turing. <laughs> and so he and his wife uh, went to London and he was Turing's first American collaborator. And so I grew up hearing stories about Harry Husky and Alan Turing. I mean, it is a great world. And you know, what do I know? The guy's Husky just shows up, you know, in front of a class one day in my sophomore year. And then I got to work with him. He was great. That's really cool. Um, yeah. One question I had was, so what, what are your thoughts on this whole UNC comp site requiring admission and then them taking it away and then that this whole thing that's been happening. I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in fact, I happened to meet on another topic with um, the senior associate dean this morning, uh, Jay Cable. We were talking about something else, but at the end of the meeting, I happened to mention this topic because I feel so strongly about it. Uh, uh, so in a nutshell, the department faculty is drowning. We have gone in the last, whatever, 12 or 13 years from having 140 majors to having 1800 majors and no increase basically in faculty. To give you an idea of how unreasonable this is, I was talking to somebody yesterday who's a high school senior who wanted my advice about which college he should go to. And, you know, we've talked a couple of times. I, you know, I'm happy to talk to a bright undergraduate, I mean, undergraduate high school seniors on which college I should go to. He got into UNC, he got into NC State, he got into a bunch of other places. Uh, one of the places he's considering is Carnegie Mellon. Okay, Carnegie Mellon, you can look this up. How many computer science professors do they have at Carnegie Mellon? I don't know, 90 or whatever. I mean, some number like, somebody look it up and tell me. Okay, how many computer science majors do they have at Carnegie Mellon? According to the student, they uh, admit 200 a year, so 800 total. Okay, so now somebody look it up and tell me how many computers, what's the size of computer science faculty at Carnegie Mellon? I think it was like 90 or something. Okay, 
but they have dramatically bigger, like three times the size of the department, right? And the number of majors they have is like 800 compared to 1800. So it's like less than half of the number of majors and they have like three times the size of the faculty. Okay, Niha, do, do, do you think people get that? Yeah, I think I, I'm okay. trying to look up right now. How yeah. But I mean, it's a tremendous size difference, okay? Yeah. So then the question is, what should we do? And not just, you know, every so many years, universities and the university associations mandate that they be an outside evaluation committee on each department. Because, you know, a credit agency wants to know, how is your, you know, German literature department or whatever. So, you know, there has to be an external committee evaluation. So the same thing happens in computer science. There's an external committee evaluation, I think every eight years, okay? The last one that we had, no, not just the last one that we had, the one that we had like, not five years ago, but, whatever it was, 13 years ago, they said, what you have is pretty good, but you know what? You guys need to grow to at least 40, otherwise you're going to just sink. And you know what? We have not grown at all, okay? And then eight years later, a whole other committee comes in to do another evaluation, right? It goes every eight years. What does that committee say? Exactly the same thing. Unless you guys grow to 40, you're just going to sink. Now, so what should we do when we don't grow anywhere to 40? I don't know, we're at 30 or something. So what should we do? I mean, I think it is a disgrace, okay? I think it is just terrible. It's not just that we want to limit, that we have to limit the number of students that can major in computer science. I think we should actively, we, meaning the whole computer science community, including you guys, right? We should tell people everywhere on campus that learning about computers in a meaningful way is going to be important to your life, whatever you do, okay? If someone's going to go into pick a field, I don't know, geology, nursing, public health, uh, whatever, architecture, right? Any, any of those fields are going to be affected by computers more in 10 years than they are now, right? Now, that means that anybody who is, say, a nurse or a geologist or a public health professional, they're going to need to know more about computers 10 years from now than they do now, right? Especially if they're going to be in a position to make some decisions. It's not going to be sufficient to know how to you know, operate a spreadsheet. They're gonna to have to know things about privacy and about how encryption is done and about uh, what happens to public sharing of knowledge, uh, you know, all kinds of things about computers in a sophisticated way. So if I had my druthers, I would require every undergraduate to have at least two courses in computer science, right? They should know how to program in a, they should be skilled to program so they understand what is, what, how computers work. But they should also know something deeply about how computers are affecting their special area and how it's likely to affect their special area in five or 10 years. So I'm against, I think it's a shame that we have to limit the number of majors, but I think it's even more of a shame that we don't require every undergraduate to take a couple of computer science courses. Why do you think like we aren't getting funding? Like why are we so underfunded? We're one of the top CS departments in the nation. It is just amazing. Okay, uh, here is what all universities grapple with. What happens is that the funding coming from the state to a state university is just about steady, okay? There's not like dramatic increases in allocation of funding from the state as far as I could tell. I'm not a specialist in this, but that seems to be, okay? So now, how do you fund the faculty? Well, in a campus where there is a whole range of fields and a whole range of faculty seniorities, even if the head of the entire campus wants to make significant changes, they're limited because they can't just willy-nilly fire people, right? You can't just say to a professor whose specialty uh, is not being sought by 
you know, 100 or 200 or 500 students. Uh, I'm sorry, sir or ma'am, you know, uh, your classes only get like 15 people. And so we can't afford to keep you anymore, right? So then the only way that you could really hire new people is when uh, some people resign or retire. And that in a university doesn't happen that much. And so a university, especially a state university is very limited in what they could do. And also the, in a department like uh, computer science, the total amount of money that goes through the department is mostly not from the state, but from various grants. Uh, I haven't looked recently, but last time I looked, something like 70% of the money that flows through computer science comes from various research and gifts. And those are targeted for specific things. It's like, you know, the somebody responds to a proposal, whether it's NSF or Intel or Google, you know, somebody has sent them a proposal. We want to work on, you know, computer generated holography. And, you know, Facebook, whoever says, oh, this is cool. You know, we'll give you this pile of money and you guys could work, go work on this, right? We can't just take that money and say, oh, what we really like to do is offer another section of computer organization. They say, wait, 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 that's not what we gave you the money for, right? And so you have a very limited pool of money for teaching and that comes from the state and that basically has an increase. Now in a private university, there is more flexibility and a lot of private universities make money on things like um, master's programs and even undergraduate programs in which the tuition that the undergraduates pay go more directly to the departments whose courses they are taking. And there is movements afoot to have that happen more like that at Carolina, but at right now, as far as I could tell, that doesn't happen. So the amount of all this increase in students taking computer science classes hasn't translated into more funding for the department. So what do you think we should do then? If we're running out of money and the department is getting overwhelmed, what's the solution? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, everybody, everybody's trying to solve that problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wish I knew what the solution was. I mean, uh, when things happened when I was an undergraduate, you know, this was in the late 60s. <laughs> I mean, we protested, but protesting doesn't seem to be the style these days. Um, just to, um, I'm sorry, I didn't wish I had, I wish I had a solution. Uh, Peter, did you have something? Um, so I actually went to the um, CMU directory. Yes. And according to the table, they have 119 CS professors. <laughs> yes, so thank you. So 119 CS professors and 800, if I understood from the student, 800 majors, okay? So they have, ding, if we divide that up, there is approximately, what, seven majors per professor. Is that right? You know, the rough calculation, okay? So we have... 1,800 declared majors, and we have roughly 30 faculty. So it's 180 divided by three. So it's something like 60 majors per professor. I mean, it's just, it's almost an order of, it's almost a factor of 10 more. Yeah, it's really terrible. I wish I had a solution, but I mean, my sense is make your voices heard. I mean, it's, it's a really terrible situation. It's a really terrible situation. So um, this might be a, a dumb question, and if so, I apologize. But I don't think um, it's how you could an ask a dumb question. <laughs> You've always been very smart. Thank you. Um, when I was taking um, other classes at, at UNC, you know, I took an English class and and I took a physics class, and both of them, the English class was just straight up taught by a grad student, and, and the physics class was heavily assisted by the grad student. And I know that UNC has one of the best grad programs in the world, 
So, you know, I could say as a student being taught by one of our grad students, I, I would still very feel very fulfilled in that. And could that, you know, lead to a possible solution of our lack of professors? Thank you. Uh, we're discussing that a lot. And so especially advanced graduate students. So uh, specifically, I've suggested one of our recent master's graduates uh, who taught a class last semester that's undergraduate class in ARVR, um, teach that. And he did that last year. And he took my class, you know, a couple of years ago. He does a really good job. Nick Rakowski, I recommend him highly to you. He's going to teach the ARVR class, COM 590. Uh, go for it. Yes. So I think that's really good. And I've suggested some other uh, really advanced graduate students who I think would be really good at teaching. Now, what happens is that people who are advanced graduate students, you know, they're PhD students. And uh, most PhD students these days don't seem to be interested in teaching as much as in research. And um, we've, we've been talking on the faculty a lot about, you know, how do we uh, or should we inspire more graduate students to want to teach? And the general feeling is we don't want to force them to teach because then that would not turn out well if we inspire them in some way, then that might be better. So that's actively being worked on. Um, because I completely agree with you. I think that the really good graduate students do a really good job in teaching. And what I do, by the way, while we're on the subject is I think undergraduate teaching assistants are really great. And so I've long believed in having teaching assistants that are at all levels of experience. So I think that that helps the students who are taking the course. It helps the, the undergraduate TAs who have taken the course like a year ago. And that helps the graduate students you know, who then have taken a course like that three or four years ago. So I think there's a whole, um, you know, like a large cast of characters that all contribute uh, toward making the learning experience optimal. I mean, I believe in this so much that I pay some of my discretionary funds to hire more undergraduates. I think we have time for- Some of you know that, right? Uh, Millen knows that, Rohitha knows that. Uh, yeah. Michael, do you have a question? Yeah, so uh, Professor Fuchs, as you've, you have mentioned previously, I wonder what is the reason that um, as a public university, why can't the funds be allocated more flexibly according to the enrollment of the student like the private universities? Good question. By the way, Michael, do you really not have a camera or because we choose not to show us? Well, I'm, uh, my internet is kind of poor oh, sorry, because I'm okay. outside. Yes. I'm outside on so, a cellular that's, connection. That's a deep question. And my understanding is that there are a bunch of different mechanisms that have been set up of how the allocation of funds from the state legislature to the university system, to the campuses, and down through the various parts of the campus are allocated. And they are being upgraded, I think, as we speak. There is, my guess is, one of the reasons that they are not totally according to where the students are taking them is that then there would be tremendous shortfalls in certain departments. So imagine classes say in a, imagine a class where there's only a few students. If that professor's department only got the tuition that those students paid, then there would not be nearly enough to pay the salary of that professor. And you know what do you do in that case? All right, yeah. Ryan, do you want? To, oh, sorry, did I interrupt? No, but you, there's a person who asked that question. Michael, was it? Or did, or I just just asked you, Nihar, Do you understand that problem? Yeah, I that problem. It's a yeah. yeah, sort of. Thanks. Yeah, but I mean, the situation is fundamentally: can you fire people in certain fields where there's not where there are insufficient students? To, um, to pay for those salaries. And there are for-profit universities that 
um, do that on a uh, pretty regular basis. That is what they do is they hire, rather than hiring permanent faculty, they hire faculty in a year by year contract on a class by class contract. And then they don't offer a class unless they know that there will be sufficient students to pay for that class. Uh, but that makes for a very uh, different university experience than what you have at Carolina. And so one of the things I could recommend is take advantage of the fact that you could take all kinds of classes in all kinds of fields and you don't have to pay extra for it. I think um, we'll, we'll have one more question and then we'll round it off with a little bit more information on ACM and what we're gonna do in the future. Sounds great. Ryan, do you wanna ask the last question? Yeah, I was just wondering what is like, you know, what is your favorite research topic that you've pursued in your lifetime? Wow, in my life or right now? Okay, let's narrow it down to uh, right now. Cause... Wow, okay, I'll tell you right now. Uh, egocentric reconstruction. All right, so the idea, so uh, <laughs> I can see <laughs> Monty smiling. Okay, so uh, I really uh, still believe in this initial vision that we're going to have displays in our glasses and then we'll be freed from just having to look at everybody through these little squares. Are you with me, Ryan? Yes, so yes. what does it take for us to have this feeling that we're all sitting around in a room? Just like, you know, we would be sitting around, you know, say in the lobby of Citizen or Brooks, right? What like does it take? Well, it takes, it takes two things fundamentally. It takes some way of capturing the 3D environment and 3D us, right? You know, you're holding your hand and what shirt you're wearing and the way you're smiling, you know, that, that communicates to me, right? And the way I am, and then maybe the environment, you know, so... If, we, if I want to show you, you know, this booklet, that it also picks up the booklet, right? And then we need some way of displaying it, right? So you need capture, reconstruction, and display, right? So the display, we're working on all of those. The display basically needs to be wide field of view and in a compact form factor that's like our eyeglasses that we're willing to basically wear all day because we're not going to wear closed, you know, like as much as I like my Quest, I'm not gonna wear it all day because I don't wanna be taken away from my nice environment here. And even the open augmented reality displays like HoloLens are, are too bulky. I'm not gonna wear that all day. You know, you couldn't pay me enough, right? So you need the display and we're working on that and other people working on how to do that. But then the other part that's even more exciting in some ways is how do you capture the person's body and the environment? And my answer to that is imagine that you have a bunch of tiny cameras that's like this. I'm not looking at myself, so I don't know if you can see this. Okay, so these cameras that are in here are really great and they're only like three millimeters on a side. So you could mm -hmm. imagine taking say 10 of them and putting them all around the frame of your eyeglasses. You know, imagine they're like little jewels. And mm -hmm. then some of them look to the outside, some of them look down, some of them look into your eyes, some of them look down to your face, some of them look down and see parts of your shirt and maybe you know, your legs, whatever. Now, all those 10 or 20 cameras together maybe could reconstruct you, right, Ryan? And then you could send your 3D body and your 3D environment to all the other people here, right? And then we put that all together in our displays and we see all the people sitting wherever we have decided we're gonna sit. That's the most exciting project. It's gonna take well, another 10 years maybe, but I think we'll live long enough that we'll be able to do it because then all we need is the things we're wearing. So you and I walk around outside and we'll, you know, even if we're in different places in the world, we could still see each other, you know, and you tell me about the nice place you're walking around in. I tell you about the nice place and we could be in one place or another place or some combination. All right, well, thank you. That was also, I, that was a question I had earlier because I've been keeping up with like Microsoft's holoportation a little bit. And I was gonna ask how long till you think something like that is commonplace in our society. So we've collaborated and, with that team. Um, we have several of our UNC graduates that are members of that team, yeah. Wow, I did it's not know that. Great team. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's wonderful. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah.
All right. So most of them are now in Google, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about ACM, which is a really important topic, and student ACM chapters. So, Regu, you want to kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. So we just want to thank everybody for asking questions and participating, and we hope you guys had a fun time. Uh, we also hope you choose to be a part of ACM at Carolina to be a more to be a part of more events such as this one. Again, being a part of ACM enables you to chance to network with ACM members and others in the computer science faculty, attend meet, uh, events to meet students also interested in tech, learn more about the latest technologies and skills, learn about more opportunities such as internships, full-time jobs, courses, and research positions, and just be part of the international community. And I think Dr. Fuchs had a couple things to say about ACM um, uh, at the start of this meeting, and it's been around a long time, so yeah. Yeah, another thing is that we're planning on next year doing a lot more events. Hopefully they'll be in person where we can have a big banquet or something with um, all the professors in the computer science department and have everyone come out. Uh, someone mentioned a letter writing campaign. That's something that I think the ACM board will look into organizing to see if we can maybe help sponsor a letter writing campaign to the state legislature in order to get more funding for the computer science department. But basically we kind of want to be an encompassing community on campus. And so we really thank you guys for coming out to this event. We thank Dr. Fuchs a, a ton for his continued involvement and support. And uh, to become a member, you can just visit this link tree or scan this QR code. Uh, and you'll be able to sign up to get on our uh, listserv. And we will be sending out more information in the coming months and also next year on what events we will be hosting. Uh, hopefully they'll be fun and in person and we see all of you there as well. Um, if anybody from the ACM board has anything that they would like to say, or if Rudu, you want to say anything, or Dr. Fuchs, uh, feel free. Oh, yes. Could I, the thing you didn't mention that I think is so great for you guys as students, ACM, is that you get to go to conferences for next to nothing. So I've been involved in graphics conferences and, you know, some vision and medical conferences. And almost every conference organizing committee really wants to encourage students to attend. And so the student registration to most conferences is very nominal. And many of them have student volunteer programs. And I highly encourage you to go to those. So I've been going to you know, graphics conferences. And if you are at all interested in graphics, the ACM SIGGRAPH is just a fabulous experience. And you could sign up to be a volunteer and then you work a certain number of hours in a booth helping out with demos you get to meet and mingle with all these you know really interesting people you get to try out all kinds of systems and you get to you know find out you know what's happening around the world so i highly encourage you to look around at what conferences you could go to for next to nothing and you could volunteer as students Absolutely, and, and that is a very good point. Starting next year, we are going to, as ACM, as a group, go to many conferences. We're also going to have uh, funding available for students who maybe could not afford to go to a conference otherwise, so there will be funding available for that. And so uh, there's a lot of things that we're planning on doing in, this, in these upcoming few months, and uh, like you said, the conferences are a really good point as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, the ACM board will stick around for a little bit as well. But once again, we'd like to thank you so much for coming out and listening to both Dr. Brooks and Dr. Fuchs. Like we said, the full length interview with Dr. Brooks is on our YouTube channel. Um, and if you want to become a member of ACM, please join using that link tree. Uh, we'll stay back for a couple minutes, but yes, thank you everyone. And we really appreciate thank you. you.